Hello fellow adventurers and welcome back to another episode of Word Safari. In this episode we're going to look at a particular Indo-European route that looks a lot like the Indo-European route we looked at in the last episode. If you recall, if you watched the last episode, we looked at the route Gen. Today we're going to look at the route Gno. Now what does the route Gno mean? It means to know. If you think that that looks suspiciously similar, in other words our word no looks a lot like the Indo-European route Gno, you're right. We'll get to that as the episode goes on. So this is not the Indo-European root gen that we looked at last time. It means to be born or to begin. However, I do want to point out that many linguists do think there may be a very archaic connection between these two roots. By archaic, I mean it predates the time of Proto-Indo-European. By the time that the Proto-Indo-European language was spoken five to 6,000 years ago, these were two different words. These, uh, if they had been one thing at one time, had split by the time we get to the proto-language five or 6,000 years ago. However, they do look suspiciously similar. They both have a G, they both have an N. Uh, they might be a little bit different as far as the vowel situation is concerned, but many people, and I might be one of them, think that there was an archaic root that had a G and an N, and then you could do different things with it to make it either be to uh, be born or to know. Now, why would there be a connection between these two things? Well, in the archaic societies that we we're talking about, you would be likely to know best the people with whom you were born, and the people with whom you were born would be the ones you would be likely to know best. So it kind of makes sense in these archaic, archaic societies that we're talking about that a root that had some archaic meaning of to know people or to be born with them could then be distinguished by some by some slight changes. And by the way, if you know anything about Indo-European, the slight changes between these two roots are not just in the vowels, but they both have a laryngeal at the end of them that is totally gone and isn't there anymore in the surviving Indo-European languages. But we reconstruct a different laryngeal at the end of these two roots. There are three different laryngeals, we're pretty sure, in the Indo-European language. You don't have to worry about that if you don't want to, because by the time we get to Proto-Indo-European, and certainly by the time we get to all of the surviving languages like English or Latin or Greek that we're going to be talking about today, these are two separate words. These are two separate roots, but there may in fact be an archaic connection, which is interesting to ponder if you are interested in sort of digging further back in time. Okay, so let's start talking about the root Gano. What are some words that we get from the root Gano? Well, let's start with some compounds that come straight from Greek uh, that have something to do with medicine. We get a lot of medical uh, t compounds and terms from Greek because they did a lot to pioneer the medical sciences. Um, we get a word like di diagnosis from Greek. This ju just comes from the Greek diagnosis. Dia in Greek is a preposition that means through, and gno means to know, and then the sis is just like a noun ending. So literally, a diagnosis in Greek would be a knowing through. You're knowing all the way through something so you have complete knowledge or you're figuring something out that's essentially what a diagnosis is another word we get from the medical world that has gno in it that is also a compound from the greek language is prognosis prognosis is from prognosis pro was a greek preposition or thing you could put on the front of a verb that means before so prognosis just means a knowing before so when you have a prognosis it's like a prediction or maybe even foreknowledge of how a particular disease or sickness or whatever is going to go. So if you've ever noticed that diagnosis and prognosis are very similar words, they just have a different prefix, that's because they both come from this gno root because they both have something to do with knowledge. Some other words we get from the Greek gno, even though the gno is all over Indo-European, we're starting with some of these Greek compounds here, is a word gnostic. Now today we don't say the G anymore, but the Greeks did. So uh, in Greek, this word was gnostikos. You would actually say gna, you'd still say the G there in Greek. And this was an adjective in Greek that meant knowledgeable. Now, who are the Gnostics? You may or may not have heard of the Gnostics. In case you haven't, they were an early Christian sect that focused on secret knowledge. They had some ideas about Christianity that, that today would be considered uh, unorthodox. They believed that Jesus was sent uh, from heaven to basically give secret knowledge to his disciples, who then disseminated that secret knowledge to the Gnostic Christians. Um, there were other people who are Gnostics who may not be Christians in the ancient Greco-Roman world, but sort of the most famous Gnostics that we think of today were this early Christian sect, and all their name means is knowledgeable. They believed in secret knowledge uh, or something like that. 
What about gnome? Notice I put a question mark here by gnome because we're not actually sure of the etymology. The reason is that this word was actually just invented uh, about 500 years ago by a certain author. Um, and we're not sure where he got this word from. He may have gotten it from somewhere else. And so we're not actually sure that it comes from the Gnome root because he pretty much just made it up. But it kind of makes sense that it might come from, from the Gnome root because there was a Greek word Gnome, which was spelled exactly like that, um, that meant intelligence or something smart. And these creatures we call gnomes, at least stereotypically or mythologically or whatever you want to call it, um, were, were considered to be smart. So there may be something about intelligence or wisdom behind the name Gnome. Again, I'm cautioning you that this might not be right, which is why I put a question mark by it, but I thought I would put it in here anyways because I like that etymology, and so I'm just going to throw it out there, something that is at least possible. What other compounds? We get some other uh, compounds from the Greek word gno that has something to do with knowledge. What about agnostic? Agnostic is just an adjective that means not knowing or something like that. And it, it, it can be a noun referring to somebody who doesn't know. It just comes from this Greek compound agnostos. The a ah at the beginning is a Greek prefix that means uh, not or without something. And the gno part is, of course, the gno root. So the Greek adjective agnostos actually just means unknown or maybe just unknowable if you can't know it at all. The way we use this word today, if you are agnostic about something, then you are characterized by not knowing about it. And maybe you don't know just because you don't know, but because you believe nobody can know. So the most common way we use this word today is, is in religious terms. Like if you're agnostic about the existence of God or something like that, then you maintain that it can't be known. Uh, but that's where the, the, the root agnostos, or rather the word agnostos comes from, because it has to do with not knowing. That's all that word means. And you can see the gno in there in the middle. Let's shift to Latin, and I'm going to use these compounds here to shift from Greek to Latin. We get the word ignorant from a Latin compound that actually means the same as agnostic. The I is from in, which is the equivalent to the alpha or a ah at the beginning of agnostic that means not. So in uh, can mean not in Latin. Igno, not knowing, ignorans. That's literally the meaning of this word ignorans in Latin, which is where we get our English word ignorance. Ignorant. Now, originally, that's all it meant. It was not a pejorative. If you were ignorant, you just didn't know about something. Today, we've kind of driven that forward a little bit and made it a little bit more negative. So you don't just not know something, but you're ignorant of it. And maybe you're an ignorant person because it's something you should know. So interestingly, we've taken these two compounds, one from Greek, one from Latin here on the same page, and taken them in kind of two different semantic directions. If you're agnostic about something, you may be saying that nobody can know about it. But if you're ignorant about something, People might say everybody should know about and you just don't and that makes you ignorant, even though etymologically we get these from the same uh, no root here. All right, let's keep going with uh, some of these Latin terms now that we've sort of flipped uh, the script from Greek to Latin. Let's look at some Latin terms. What about a word like notorious? Now, if you watched the last episode when we were talking about the gen root, um, we saw that with words like native, which come from the Latin nativum, uh, and other, other such words that start with an N from the gen root, I said that the G would just fall off at the beginning because they didn't want to say gna, and so they just said na. Well, something similar is going to happen with the gno root, specifically in Latin. Latin, where originally, if you had the gno root at the beginning of a word, it would have been gno something, but then the Romans just stopped saying the G, and so it just became no. That's what's going on here in a word like notorious. This would have originally been gnotorious, but you can see that's pretty hard to say, and you can understand why the Romans would have stopped saying the G, and so it just became notorious, but it totally comes from this gno root. The, the word notorious comes from the Latin word notus, which has the no root at the beginning, plus a t, because this was originally the past participle of a verb that meant to know. So the past participle of a verb that means to know is known. So if you are notorious, you are etymologically well known. Of course, today, this word has taken a little bit of a semantic shift, just like we were seeing on the last slide with words like agnostic or ignorant. It's never entirely predictable what direction uh, semantics are going to evolve in. And that's certainly the case with notorious where it just comes from a sort of neutral uh, word in Latin that meant known, but now it means well-known, but not usually in a good way. If you're notorious for something, 
usually it's not a good thing. Now, of course, we have certain individuals, like certain rappers with the word notorious in their name, where they're trying to use it in a good way. But even that is kind of playing off of the negativity to make them kind of cool in some way. Uh, but, but the etymology is neutral. It wasn't necessarily bad to be notorious going all the way back to the Latin root. Let's talk about some other words to start with N-O or N-O-T that come from the Gano root in Latin. How about a word that we probably use every day, and that is note. Note just comes from the Latin noun nota, which has the no plus the T because it's built off of this past participle stem, even though it's now just a regular noun nota. A nota in Latin didn't necessarily mean a note. It could be a note, but it could just be a mark or a sign. It can be anything that you put onto something, you know, mark, sign, note, whatever, that is trying to make something known to somebody else. That's really all a note is. Now today, we can use this as a noun, as something you write yourself to make something known to your future self or to somebody else. So you can see the knowledge idea is still continuing here when it comes to our use of the word note today. And of course, we also use it as a verb. If you note something, then you're trying to make something known to other people. What about a word like notice? Of course, it totally comes from the same root. Notice comes from the Latin noun notitia, which is just built off of this gno root with some stuff there at the end. Originally, notitia meant fame or knowledge, um, and then it came to be something designed to make something known, like a notice that's on a wall. If it says notice and then it tells you some stuff, it's like a note, but it's a little more complicated, right? Because it's trying to get, get you to know something. That evolved even further to our verb notice, like when you take notice of something or you notice something, then something is being made known to you, which again is a little bit of a semantic evolution of this term that is actually pretty recent within the past few hundred years because that wasn't, that wasn't necessarily the original meaning of this word in Latin. And in case you're wondering, you can probably come up with many other words that start with note that have something to do with making known, like notify. If you notify somebody, anything that has if I at the end comes from a Latin word that means to make. So you are making something known to somebody if you notify them of it. Another Latin word, and this is a compound uh, that comes from the Gano root in Latin, is annotate. Now, many episodes ago, we talked about the odd word, and we talked about how odd at the beginning of anything would assimilate. In other words, the D would become like the next consonant, and that's exactly what's going on here with annotate. Notice it's got two ends. That's because the first end is actually from odd. It's from odd notatum. Uh, so you got the note part there in the middle with an odd there at the beginning, which means to or toward or onto uh, or, or something like that. So this Latin word annotare, that's the verb, and then the past participle is annotatum, which is actually where we get annotate from with that second T there, means to observe or to note down. And so when you annotate, you're taking notes on top of something. You're taking something, you're putting notes on top of it or in the margins or whatever, and that's uh, that's etymologically and oftentimes actually how we use the word annotate. It just comes from this Latin compound. What, what, what about a word like noble? You might not have thought noble being connected to words like note, but it actually is. Notice the T stuff is not there at the end, so you just get the no root plus this other suffix, which is bilis in Latin. This word comes from the Latin adjective nobilis, which means renowned or well-known, and etymologically that's all it means. Of course, again, then there was some semantic evolution in this case, unlike with notorious, which kind of got worse with time. This word got better with time. It wasn't it was just well-known. We don't just use it to mean well-known or renowned anymore. Now it's like famous in a good way or well thought of. And we can even use it as an adjective, like you have noble qualities, which doesn't just mean you have well-known qualities. It means you have qualities that, that you would expect from people who are well-known. And therefore, because they're well-known, we think they're good people, or at least they think they're good people and they've told us they're good people. Um, so, so again, you can, see the, you can see the semantic evolution at work uh, as we go through the years. But it originally just comes from this root gno, which means known. That's all noble really means. Let's start making some more compounds from Latin with the gno root. So what if we put the Latin word cone on the front of the gno root? What can we do with it? Now, the Latin word cone means with or together, and sometimes it can just kind of have an emphatic effect to the word. So our word cognition comes from the Latin noun cognitio. You have the co, which is from cone on the front. You have the gno root in there with just the G in the end, which we saw with the gen root sometimes as well. And then you have this noun suffix itio. So cognitio in Latin just means a getting to know, 
or an acquaintance or something like that. So you can see when you take the no root plus with, you know together, which means you get to know sort of metaphorically. And of course, again, we get words like cognition from, from, from this uh, compound in Latin cognitio, because today cognition is the process by which one comes to know. It's what's going on in your brain when you are thinking about something or figuring it out. Now, we can keep piling on more prefixes onto this. You probably can guess where we're going because we have other words that look a lot like this. Let's put some other prefixes on it, like in. We already talked about how in can mean not in Latin. So in cognitum, you can see there's a bunch of pieces to this, but once you break them up, it's easy to see what they are. So in is not, co is together, gna is to know, the gna root, and then itum is just one of these endings we've been talking about. So incognitum in Latin would just mean unknown, which is pretty similar to how we use the word incognito today. If you are incognito, then you are unknown to others. Maybe you're not unknown to yourself, but you are unknown to you, to others. And, and we've also used this Latin word in places like the phrase terra incognita, which means unknown land. That's really all it means. Okay, so that's one prefix. That's, you can put in on the front of a cognito form. What else can you put? How about re? Re is another prefix in Latin that means back or again, or again, it can also just show some kind of emphasis. So our word recognize also comes from Latin. And again, you can see all of the parts here, re, cogno, scare, and in that case, that's a verb ending, the scare stuff. So we don't need to worry about that too much here. So what would re cognoscere mean in Latin? It would mean acknowledge or recall to mind. And you can see the re part. You can see what it's doing there. To cognoscere just means to know or to figure something out. But to re cognoscere means to know again, to go back to something you already knew and then say, oh, yeah. I, I know that. I recognize it, which is exactly what that word means in English or something. When you recognize something, it's, it, it's something that you're not just learning for the first time, generally, right? It's something that you already knew, and that's what the re prefix is doing there. What else can we do? Uh, how, about, how about some French uh, derivatives of some of these Latin uh, uh, cognates that we've just been looking at? What about the word reconnaissance? Now, you can just look at this word and see that it came from French because the way that there's all these double letters and the vowels are a little bit different and everything else, but it comes from these Latin compounds that we had just been looking at, albeit uh, the, the vowels and consonants have changed somewhat. So we get our word reconnaissance from Old French, reconnaissance, which just meant the act of surveying. But of course, that came from this Latin recognitio, which means originally to go back over something that you already knew, to recognize, to come to know it better. That's the idea of a survey. When you're surveying something, it's usually something you already knew about and you're just trying to remind yourself of it. Or, or renew your knowledge of it, or increase your knowledge of it. Today, we've gotten a little sloppier with our, our word reconnaissance, because you can uh, do reconnaissance over things that maybe you have never seen before. Or here's another uh, word that we get from this family. You can reconnoiter things that maybe you have never seen before. What's another uh, word that we get through French from this family of Latin words? How about a connoisseur? A connoisseur of something doesn't have the re at the front, so we're not talking about doing something again this time. But this comes from the old French connoisseur, which just means one who knows. It just comes from this cogn root in Latin with the co on the front, obviously. And so if you're one who knows, then you're probably one who is well acquainted with a particular thing. And today in English, a lot of times we use it not to just mean somebody who is well acquainted with something, but somebody who likes something, which kind of goes together. If you like something, you are likely to get well acquainted with it. If you're a connoisseur of some particular kind of food or whatever. That seems to be uh, a lot of the context in which we use a word like connoisseur, but it, it comes through French from this family of words in Latin. One more French word we get, uh, or rather French term that comes through French from Latin from this family of words is a quaint. Now, a quaint doesn't really look like the Gano root, and you might not guess that this comes from the Gano root at all, but when you trace its history back, it actually makes sense. So we get a quaint from Old French acquainter. Okay, so far so good. Still doesn't really look like the Gano root, but okay. Let's trace acquainter back to Latin. Acquainter comes to, actually comes from Latin ac 
cognitare. So we got the gna root there in the middle. We got the co before it, which, as we've talked about, means together or with or something. But then we get with this ak on the front, which is actually this odd thing that we've been seeing where there's assimilation of the D to the following C. So this was originally a cognitare, and you can see how if you run a cognitare together, you get a cointen. And that's basically what happened between Latin and Old French, where all of that kind of got run together to acquainté. And then that run together form got borrowed into English as acquaint. So you can see the process of evolution from a cognitare all the way to acquaint uh, once you are acquainted with it, as it were. Now, what does a cognitare mean in Latin? Again, you already know all these parts, even if you don't know anything about, about Latin, just because you've been watching this, you know what the gna root is, it means to know, you know what the co part is, it means together, and the ac part is from odd, it means to or towards. So to know something together toward something or somebody, that's really what you're doing when you're ac cognitare something. So really, if you acquaint somebody with something, you're just introducing something into their knowledge. The introduced part is really the odd part here in Latin. You're taking knowledge to or for or towards somebody, and that's really what's going on there with the beginning. So there you go. Acquaint comes from the gno root in Latin too, thanks to uh, some interesting things that have happened between Latin and Old French uh, when we borrowed it. All right, so that's the Gnome root in Greek and Latin. There's one more very important set of words from the Gnome root that I know all of you know about, and that is words from the Germanic languages, from the Germanic family. In other words, words that are native to English that we didn't borrow from Greek or Latin or French, like everything we have just been looking at. Of course, at the head of this list has to come our word no, K-N-O-W. Uh, this is just the Germanic variant of, of Gno based on Grimm's Law. So remember Grimm's Law, this is something we talked talked about, says that, uh, that there was a whole series of consonant sound shifts between Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Germanic, in other words, the ancestor of all the Germanic languages, including English. So G's became K's. That's one of the mutations that happened. G's became K's. Um, and so it's no surprise that the root Gno became Kno with a K in the Germanic languages, because that's exactly what Grimm's Law says should happen. Now, of course, today in English, we don't pronounce the K anymore, just like the Romans got tired of saying no, and they just said no. We got tired of saying no and just said no. So actually, us and the Romans were on the same page as far as that goes, and we, we both simplified this to just no without that consonant at the beginning. However, in Old English times, that K was still pronounced because they actually wrote it kanawan with that C, which is usually how they would write a K sound in Old English. So this was kanawan, uh, and it was just a regular verb in Old English. However, that K sound does still survive on a particular word that you probably use quite a bit in English, and it survived because Old English put a prefix onto it, and that enabled that K to survive because it was no longer at the start of a word, and it wasn't as inconvenient to say anymore. That word is acknowledge. Acknowledge still has that K sound. And sometimes we actually weaken it to a G sound, but that happened later. It still has that K sound there before the end. It never fell out because there was a prefix that was put on it all the way back in Old English time. So acknowledge comes from the Old English onkrawan, and then the ledge part at the end is actually because it got kind of conflated with another word, which was knowledge, if you were wondering. Um, but it ultimately comes from this verb onkrawan, acknowledge, and on now on, the own in Old English meant on or toward or something like that. So if you own Kanawan, then you come to recognize or understand, you know on, you on know something, which means you're getting into knowledge about it, or you are admitting that you have knowledge about it, you're on knowing it, you're saying, I know that thing, yes, I acknowledge this particular thing. So you can still see that that's how we use that word today, even though the semantics have shifted somewhat, the knowledge in the middle is still very clear. What about a whole family of other words? There's one more family of words in English that is native to our Germanic uh, inheritance that is not from Greek or Latin, so it's gonna have a K sound and not a G sound in this root that is connected to this root, but you may never guess it. But once I show it to you, you probably won't ever forget it. That is the word can. Now, when I say can, I don't mean a can like a trash can or you know a, a basket or whatever. That's not the kind of can I mean. 
I'm talking about the verb can. Like when you say I can do something, have you ever thought about what that means and why we say we can do something? Where does that come from? Can actually just comes from the old English word con, which is spelled exactly the same way and pronounced very similarly. Slight vowel difference, although depending on your dialect of English, you might still say con or something like that. Um, so what did this verb mean in Old English? It actually didn't necessarily mean can as in be able. It meant you knew how to do something. And you can see how that evolution might happen. If you know how to do something, can you do it or can you not do it? You can do it if you know how to do it. So you can see how this would go from a verb that originally meant to know how to do something to to be able to do something because you know how. It's a pretty natural evolution. But this verb originally meant to know, and it comes from the gano root with the G becoming K because of Grimm's Law. There's a whole family of these words in English, and we don't really think of them together anymore. Of course, we have the past tense of can, which is could, and that comes from this root too, but I, I didn't put that as a separate thing here. What about a word like cunning? Cunning actually comes from uh, the verb can, and this was part of the paradigm of the verb can or con in Old English. This comes from the participle or gerund of the same verb with that ing ending, which as you know, the ing ending today in English is a participle ending or gerund, and that's like a noun, like a uh, like, uh, I don't know, learning is fun, that ing is a gerund because it's acting as a noun. Learning is a noun that is fun, right? So cunning could be a gerund. It could be the noun form of this verb. And that's originally what it meant. It meant knowledge. It was just a noun that meant knowledge. If you can do something, you know how. Can, cunning, canning, you can see it's the same verb in there if you change the vowel a little bit. Cunning is just knowledge. It's being able to do something. It's knowing how to do something. Uh, but then, we had a semantic shift with this where today when we use the word cunning, we, we don't just mean knowledge and we definitely don't just mean being able to do something. If you have cunning, then you have knowledge. Or if we use it as an adjective, if you are cunning, then you are knowledgeable. But this word has kind of taken on some negative connotations. I mean, it can be positive in some ways, but it's more negative in the sense that, you know, that person is cunning in the sense that maybe they're a little sneaky or, or you know, they, they know too much. They know too much for their own good and therefore they can get away with things. But in some situations, that might be a good thing to have somebody who has cunning on your side if you need to be sneaky or something like that. One more word that comes from this family of words in Old English that you might not guess is uncouth. We still have the word uncouth and we throw it out every once in a while. It's probably not the most common word in the English vocabulary, but I'm sure you recognize it. Uncouth just comes from uncouth. Un or un just means not, just like today, uncouth. And sometimes we joke about if you can be uncouth, why can't you be couth? Well, you used to be able to, even though the couth word hasn't really survived in most dialects of English today, but uncouth certainly has. So the original meaning of uncouth was unknown or unfamiliar. And the reason it meant that is because this couth part is actually just the past participle of can and cunning. So can is the regular verb, cunning is the present participle or gerund, couth is the past participle. So it just means known. So uncouth meant unknown or unfamiliar. And that was originally all the word uncouth meant. Again, this word also underwent kind of a semantic shift. And just like cunning, it kind of slid down the register a little bit as far as the semantics are concerned. So it got a little bit worse than it used to because today it doesn't just mean unknown or unfamiliar. It really means socially unacceptable. If, if somebody is uncouth or you're doing something that's uncouth, it's something that your society considers to be socially unacceptable. But once again, you can kind of understand how this evolution in the semantics happened because it went from unknown to unknown within our society and therefore our society judges it and doesn't like it and we're going to call you uncouth because you're doing something that we consider to be strange or weird or unacceptable in our society. So there you go. Can, cunning, uncouth, a whole family of words. Three, These three words that, that you might not have known or even connected to each other, let alone to words like no, K-N-O-W, or diagnosis, or recognize, or anything like that. But when you trace all this back to Indo-European, it all starts to make a lot of sense. And that's what we like to do here at Word Safari. We're going to end there. Can you think of any other words that come from Deacon root? Go ahead and comment. Or if you have any other comments, uh, I'd love to hear them. See you next time.